Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind to both employees and customers love and support. Thanks to Biz Simply for sponsoring this episode as our show partner. And Biz Simply is the all in one HR, workforce management, road and operations software designed and built by hospitality experts to make every shift run like clockwork. And we join forces to help the industry to find new ways to become even more innovative in how we lead our people, how we operate, to how we grow our businesses, to how we serve our customers. Together, we want to share strategies and tools that can make the industry thrive long term, not just survive. Hospitality is a human business, it's a service business, it's a concierge business, it's building an experience, and that is a human business. The role of technology is to eliminate as much inefficiency and work where the guest doesn't feel the human touch. So all the small things that you do that would never get back to the guest, that's the role of technology to simplify that so that you have more time, so that you can actually deliver that human experience. This is Jeremy Gale, founder and CEO of Breezeway. Breezeway is the leading property and operations service platform for short-term rentals. In this conversation, we hear the story of Jeremy's amazing entrepreneurial journey and how it led him to launch Breezeway. We discuss how tech can optimize hospitality businesses operation as well as the guest experience every time people stay at a property. We also talk about what the big challenges are for our industry and how that can actually be solved with tech. Jeremy shares his prediction for the industry and also some amazing opportunities lying up ahead. Jeremy shares his learning in navigating the storms of change as we have in the moment as a founder and CEO. We also talk about how you build a great team and culture and the power of servant leadership. Before you tune in, please sign up for our weekly newsletter, Maverick Talk, via hospitalitymavericks.com. Here you'll find much more insights into what Maverick leaders know and do. And you will never miss an episode. Now, over to you, Jeremy. Today, we, we're going to be talking, I like there's two themes that comes again and again in uh, my journey and what I get really excited about. One is people, uh, another one is tech. And I am a big believer, and some people, you're probably going to be bored to death out there, be saying tech can actually do the heavy lifting for you if you really understand merging it with the people. So when that happens, beautiful things can happen and you can become a much more effective organization. So we're going to be talking about tech that can help, you know, lift your operations to the the next level. And for that, I have a great guest with me today. It's uh, Jeremy from from Breezeway. Welcome to the show. I'm really excited we we make that happen because we've been trying for for, for a long time to make it happen. Michael, thank you. Um, Pleasure to be here. Excited to chat with you. So tell tell the audience a bit about, you know, who are you and, uh, you know, what led up to launching Breezeway and, you know, what journey are you on and what problems are you solving? Yeah, I love that. Uh, I love that intro. I'm Jeremy Gall. I'm the founder and CEO of Breezeway. Breezeway is a property care and operations platform um, that helps professional property managers and hosts coordinate communicate, verify detailed work at their properties so they can deliver the best experience to clients. Uh, That's a mouthful. Um, I've been in the vacation rental industry since 2005. Prior to starting Breezeway, I started a company called Flipkey. It's a large vacation rental marketplace, which we sold to TripAdvisor um, in 2012. And, you know, I love the way you said that. How did you get on this journey? Um, always loved travel, um, and got on this journey really through, through my time at Flipkey, becoming really familiar with short-term rentals, vacation rentals, hospitality providers, help them on the marketing side, um, through our marketplace at Flipkey. And then really learned that operations and back office work was this big need and a growing focus for the industry. 
And so I jumped in. And that's super interesting because actually you were helping them with the solving a different problem, but then you saw an opportunity within their business, which often sometimes we forget a bit like, you know, we have to deliver the marketing promise. It's like the operation systems and the people that actually has to go and deliver that promise. Is that, did you see there was like a big interaction gap there from how did they do it before? We can all guess they probably did pen and paper and spreadsheets. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's right. I think there was a gap that, and I think you could see it through, I think you could see it in the media that was available to uh, short-term and vacation rental operators in the conference programming that was available, the conversations that were happening in the industry. Uh, And I think it was just part of the sort of the timeline of the industry that in, you know, in the 2000s as everything was coming online and then all these, you know, Verbo was coming online, HomeAway was starting, Airbnb was starting, all the emphasis was around disruption on the marketing side and disintermediating or providing other options from property manager websites to be able to search. Same thing that was happening on the hotel side, maybe a couple of years later. Um, And so it was natural that the industry was really hyper-focused on marketing. But I felt that at some point that would settle and that these marketing sort of channels, you know, some would rise to the top, that would become sort of like settled territory. And you'd have your default channels that you'd work on, you'd have your own website, you'd figure out your marketing, and that your challenges would shift um, more towards service, more towards quality, which means the spotlight is on the spotlight's on operations and how you do the work. What is it that, that makes you guys or Breezeway unique? What makes you stand out? What is it that, why are you different than any other operation platform? Uh, I think we were the first who were crazy enough to try and, um, we, we were certainly the first who were crazy enough to try and jump in and say that, you know, property care operations and service was another core piece of technology, not just a feature, but a core product to the technology stack for property managers. Um, I remember speaking with uh, the founder of a software company very early on in our our journey at Breezeway, um, a property management software company. And he was like, Jeremy, you're you're, you're a decently smart fellow. Like, why are you gonna do this? You know, the property management software kind of covers some of this maintenance work. Um, and, and, you know, this is built into the software. Um, and I just felt we'd worked with a lot of those property management software companies and I'd known and I'd looked and, you know, I had so many colleagues and friends that I'd developed over my time at Flipkey that I was close with their business. And I knew that property management is such a broad based discipline, you have to be good at so many different things. And that then puts a lot of pressure on the technology to be good at all of those disciplines as well. And eventually that starts to fall apart because it's very difficult. You know, look at this. We we had some technical difficulties a little bit this morning, getting into, you know, podcast recording software, which we won't name, but, um, you know, and that's a very discreet, um, subject matter you know it's very discrete value podcast podcast software software has to do one thing you know not very much property management software and technology has to cover such a wide spectrum it's very difficult to optimize across all of those disciplines across all of the ways that people do work because they do it differently and really optimize those tools on a really broad stack and so you know i think that's what breezeway came in and said look, this is a comprehensive problem. It's not a feature. It's a real product. It's actually more than a product. It's a platform because operations is a full half of your business and it's a really important half of your business. Um, And it requires somebody to come in and solely focus on that and then help bifurcate and split the burden of your technology stack so that you can focus, someone can focus on the front end and somebody can focus on the back end. That's very typical. And and the thing is, it's incredibly typical for your hotel operator listeners. You know, this is old hat. This is how 
hotels have operated for 30 years using a massive piece of software from Oracle and a massive piece of software from Amadeus. Um, one for the front office reservations and another for back office service. It's very du jour, you know, it's like common. Um, but in property management, short term, long term, student housing, people hadn't really thought of it that way. One of the things when I looked at your software, I also seen, you know, a lot of back of house or back end software, operational software. It looks almost like a consumer experience. It's not like the, uh, it doesn't feel like a typical, you know, very database driven tick box kind of solution actually and it looks like you know it's, it could be like i went to go on my instagram on my, my my tiktok it's like same kind of is that on i guess that is on purpose but like a lot of workforce tools actually lack that kind of interaction on the user experience in, in my experience and they're coming coming along now but they, you know they are they're coming along they're starting to catch up but that's absolutely right you know, when you log into Breezeway, it doesn't feel like you are logging into Excel or even Salesforce. You know, there's a lot of a lot of products will look enterprise type products will look like you know very they they prettied up a DOS based system and put it on the website, but it still sort of follows that very database driven sort of model. And I think we learned early on at Breezeway that. Part of the problem with task management software is that it needs to be really simple for the end user. Adoption is such an important piece of the puzzle, right? And we, we learned this early on in 2017. You know, we'd be talking to managers and they would say, uh, and prospects, and they would say, well, you know, we, we tried something like this before and people couldn't figure it out or... They couldn't get adoption like by field staff uh, because it looked so cumbersome and people didn't want to use it. And so we figured out early on it was worth the investment. And so, so first it was worth the investment to make sure that field staff felt comfortable using this tool. We have to remember also, right, so much of hospitality and property management is run from the field and it's run from folks that are using their, their personal device. They're using their own phone to do this work. And so it's got to feel really comfortable for them. That was one part of it. And then the other part was, and I think we'll probably get into this, the concept that whether you have one property or a thousand, the standard of work that you need to deliver to bring a concierge service, hospitality-like experience to the person who is at that property that you're interacting with, it is very similar. Um, one has a scale issue from an enterprise perspective, right? So they'll need tools for reporting and they'll need permissions and other things. But at the end, the person in the field is trying to do these the same thing, prepare a piece of property, make sure the standards of the property are really tight and good, and they need to do it the same way. So if we could build tools that are approachable and easy to use for somebody who has two or three properties or one and someone who has 5,000, um, it puts us in a better position and, and clients appreciate it. What are the typical things you have seen or what learnings around like implementation when you go in and work with operators, you know, what, like what are the typicals like, you know, wins, transformations happening, but also like what are the struggles? What are the barriers? There's like two questions in there. Yeah, maybe I'll do the struggles first. The, um, I mean, look, you have to, it's like anything in your business. If you're making a business change, if you're making a process change, whether it's a new piece of technology or just a new way some optimization that you're you're bringing to your business. Now, if you have any folks that work with you, employees or service partners, you have to bring them along, right? You have to communicate why you're making this change, why it's great for the business, why it's great for them, why it's going to help them actually get their job done easier. And so I think the first struggle is, you know, that does put a little weight on the on the customer. They have to do, they have to be prepared to do that, but, but it's no different than anything else they're doing that is a change in their business. And so I think that's one. Another is um, people can become set in their ways, right? Your business can find this 
operating rhythm that is working well for you that has kind of become like quicksand and you're stuck in it. Um, it can be a struggle to, you know, be ready to make that change. And I think inertia is part of the problem. Uh, there's loads of people and think about it. Now we've just been through a pandemic. We've been through, now we're in a, you know, very dynamic global macroeconomic period. Um, challenging for folks who have a process that's sort of working for them to lift their head up, get out of that quicksand and like not get stuck in their ways and say, okay, great. Like how can I make an operational change or an optimization that can really help me? I think those are the two struggles. Once you can get over those, what you can learn in implementing and that when that we've seen with Breezeway is that you know, now we've you know, 2,000 different customers around the world who are using this tool to get their work done. We've seen the way so many people do it, and we've implemented so many different types of clients. When folks come to us, when new customers come to us and they start talking about their workflows, we're in a position to be consultative and actually help people rethink some of that process. And I think very often a light bulb goes off and folks are like, wow, this is really interesting. Like I, I was interested in operational technology for the efficiency and for improving the way my business goes. I didn't expect I would also be learning um, some new processes and some some big improvements into how I do this. What happens when you know when you know let's say they they, they get it right and they get the you know technology to work and the processes start so they they see other wins then you know they're gonna do it faster productivity is an obvious one, but there's other like wins in the business where you've seen like, wow, okay, that I wouldn't expect that or. Yeah, I think it's a, I would, I'm surprised on the expansion that we see from our client base. I think what the, what is a windfall benefit of streamlining your operations, which may sound obvious, but I don't think it's usually what's on people's radar when they, when they make this change is that the confidence that you have in the way your operation is running leads to becomes contagious and it leads to this confidence for growth and our clients expand their property portfolio at a at a at a rate that continually surprises me so whether that's organic continued growth or they now feel confident in their operation so they'll acquire other companies because they feel they can assimilate those properties in really easy um, and they can handle that growth with the same team. Their team can be more flexible. They're not stuck in this, oh, I'm adding X number of properties. I need to add X number of staff. I'm burdened by how this goes. They feel like they've got a little more leeway because they are they understand how the operation is running and they feel confidence in it. That confidence, like I said, I feel like there's a, this whole list of side benefits that that bleed through the business because you feel good about this aspect, which which can be unsettling otherwise. Very early on, thinking about Breezeway, I interviewed a dozen old customers of mine from Flipkey, old property managers, and I asked them about their maintenance program and how they felt their their maintenance program was running, and. Uh, you know, it was like, it, it was the same, Michael, as if you'd asked me like a very awkward question <laughs> where there's this long pause that I wish you hadn't asked me because it's like, ooh, I don't really know how it's going. I don't know if it's a profit center. I don't know how much it costs me. I'm concerned about how it represents my brand. I don't feel confident that it really represents my brand. Um, and then I'm delivering the experience that I really want to. I was thinking as you were saying there, I was thinking about the, the service profit chain that was done, I think it was in the 80s or 90s, 70s at Harvard University, where they talk about like, oh yeah, to, to, to build a profitable, successful business, you need to take care of your people, put the right leadership in them. Then you need to be sure to give them the tools to get the job done. Then customer service will come and a great customer service breeds loyalty, boosts sales, 
and it reverts back to profit. And you continue the circles and you continue improving within that. But actually the real, real key thing, as I said, work myself for the service profit chain through my leadership is like, it's the processes and system that actually makes people happy. It's easy to go to work. It's not painful. And I thought that was like also what I hear. And I think it's also something you, you observe, like, you know, suddenly, you know, my job is not like a pain uh, as it was before. Yeah. Or, or think about... Um... You know, think about the burden that gets placed. As, you know, there's labor, there's labor crunch that's happening around the globe. Um, it's leading more operators in whatever sector they work in to leverage more service providers rather than internal staff. Think about the burden on service providers who may be getting work from multiple clients that they're trying to, you know, coordinate and bring in. Um, they just want to do a good job, right? They want to deliver to your standards or to mine and they want to do a good job and they want to know what's expected of them. The idea of, of tasks and in detailed checklists or the right information and the right time to go to that property, like the guest or the resident has left, now's the right time to clean. Maybe you're, you know, being paid on piece rate and now's an opportunity where, you're going to do the same three jobs, but you can get a jump on one of those jobs an hour earlier because the technology is tied tightly with your lock system and with guest messaging so that you know that the guest has left and you can tell that to your service provider and they might be able to finish a little early. So not only is it, it's helping them with their expectations, it's changing the efficiency of their work. And then of course that ripples back to your business that I don't know, now maybe you'll offer early check-in to the next guest um, as an added revenue stream and everybody's happy. And it's also as a way of actually showing that, you know, I think somebody said to me, the other was really interesting, said like uh, when you use like workforce tech really well, people also know that their, their work has been seen in a way, like if there's some kind of record which there wasn't before, you know, you know, you just had the outcome, you have sales and or Budget reaching sales or not reaching sales. That was like your two outcomes you had as an operations director. Yeah, this part amazes me, right? Um, you're having people coming in and out of properties. Um, if you're a small host, you're a small operator, you may live a thousand miles away. You might live in a different country, right? You're not there. Um, if you're a big property manager and you're working in the vacation rental space or single family homes, you have hundreds, if not thousands of units. They're spread geographically. They're not all on one site. You're not there either. The folks in the field are your eyes on that property to understand the condition of the property when they walked in before they started doing their work, whether it's cleaning or it's routine maintenance or it's preventative maintenance, et cetera, um, and when they leave. And so not using a digital tool and collecting that validated information about the job that was done and some pictures so that you understand the property condition. Um, it's really doing, it's really a disservice. It's a disservice to how you can maintain your brand, but then you've also lost the opportunity. If these are, if you're not the owner of that property, you've lost the opportunity to collect more information about the job you're doing so that you can present your service well. And I think this is a, very big dynamic for property managers in the vacation rental space, right? This was part of the part of my rationale of why service would become more important, which is, you know, there is a whether correct or not a feeling from many owners that they can market their homes directly just as effectively as a property manager can. What they can't do is be the boots on the ground and the service to actually deliver to that guest. And property managers need to fight that misinformation with all the tools they have at their disposal to demonstrate how much value they're doing and how much work. There's a misconception from owners about how much work needs to be done to prepare these homes correctly. Um, and quality is, you know, quality and professionalism is the huge driver in, um, in the vacation rental space these days. What do you think the role of technology is then in, in building a great hospitality business like there has been lots of talk about tech is the savior and 
that's what would build a great hospitality of the future. And there's also the other argument, the counter argument, like it's the human experience. It's hospitality can only be done done by a human. So what what do you think the role is for tech and the place in there? Yeah, I love it. I don't think they are in conflict with each other. I love the question, but I don't think they're in conflict with each other. I think hospitality is a human business. Um, it's a service business. It's a concierge business. It's building an experience. Um, and that is a human business. The role of technology is to eliminate as much um, inefficiency and work that the guest can't feel that where the guest doesn't feel the human touch. So all the small things that you do that would never get back to the guest, that's the role of technology to simplify that so that you have more time so that you can actually deliver that human experience. The goal should not be I'm embracing technology and now I'm going to, you know, cut my staff by 50%. The goal should be I'm embracing technology and I'm repurposing X percent, 30 percent, 40 percent, whatever it is. I'm, I'm repurposing that human time to deliver an even better experience, right? Whether you're, whether you're small or large, if you're, a, if you're an individual host, um, don't you want to have more confidence in what's happening at the property and that your property is great so that you could actually lean in to your communication with a guest and make them excited, um, learn something about them and make them more excited about their experience rather than worrying about whether, you know, your property is going to be cleaned and prepared correctly and whether the job was done and are they really going to, am I waiting for a text from my cleaner to see how much, and am I coordinating how much I'm paying my cleaner and, and you know, things like that. I think it's a shift. It's definitely human. Technology is not going to replace it, but it's instrumental in helping you deliver that human touch. How about like, what do you see uh, like, you know, if we look at, you know, if we have to learn from the best and you meet a lot of operators and if you tap into to their world, what are the most progressive operators priorities right now? And what are they like strategically focusing on as we're going into, you say like a very volatile period in business because of the, the macroeconomics around the globe? Yes, I think you said this as well, which is, you know, you, you likely don't have an opportunity as a hospitality provider to start doing less, right? You see some hotels are doing that where, you know, cleaning, you know, um, turn down service is optional or you have to ask for it. So they're trying to get away with doing a little bit less. But generally, you know, the standards that consumers have come to expect, there's no going backwards. It's sort of the baseline is set. So I think the best operators are looking at their process, trying to understand what defines their brand and how can they lean into those definitional points of their brand and their service that they deliver. And then how do they optimize the work that they're doing to make sure they're executing on that? I think this optimization of quality is where people are really focused. And in fact, I don't think it's just the operators. I think the OTAs are focused on this as well. They're really focused on quality. Um, if you pull back a little bit and you think about over the last 20 plus years, you know, we did a great job getting everything online so that you could find everything. You know, now it's about how do I make sure I can find quality you know, quality places to stay? How do I sift through so much information and make sure I'm going to have a predictable experience that is still unique and, you know, wonderful for me? That's really interesting. So actually they are trying actually to understand what is the promise we've done as a brand, we're giving as a brand or business and how do we actually deliver on that more effectively and consistently? That's actually... That's that's the typical what they will be doing now to, because it's about loyalty, I guess, as well. But when you first have won the clients, you, you can keep it coming back, back to the service profit chain. Is there like an, an issue you would like to see be solved in the, the industry, so, which haven't been solved yet, but really a, in your world, it really impacts where hospitality is, you know, short-term rental? 
Yes. Uh, you know, I, I alluded to this quality sort of um, focus, and I think that will continue to be a main issue. I think there has been this undercurrent of um, regulation um, in the short term in vacation rental space. I think we have to get beyond that at some point and say, hey, look, this is a this is a powerful and valuable hospitality category um, that consumers really want and that they really appreciate. Let's in, let's focus our efforts on building more predictability and raising the quality of this category of accommodations, right? And trying to weed out if there are any bad operators or folks aren't delivering enough and, you know, not paying attention. I think that's the issue that will lead to the next phase of maturation for short-term and vacation rentals, right? There's been so much exposure to vacation rentals during the pandemic and Airbnb going public. Um, I think now the next phase is really driven by this quality issue. And safety, something we're leaning into heavily at Breezeway, I think is a big part of that. Like safety in the context of property condition reporting and our operators, you know, spending enough time thinking about the condition of their property, in addition to it being clean, of course, um, you know, what's the kind of work and attention that's being spent on safety, preventative maintenance to ensure that that's baseline to ensure that a guest arrives and has a great experience. Yeah. And also you don't get surprised, I guess, because if you're, you don't get in early enough and something happens, you could maybe have your property off the market for a period of time. That's right. I mean, the surprises of the predictability, I think is really interesting. I think that's an interesting dynamic, something that we want to be careful about with vacation rentals and short-term rentals, right? Their uniqueness, the authenticity, the home or the property where you're staying is so much a part of the experience. Um, we don't want to lose that. And yet, wouldn't it be great to re continue to remove some of the surprises that are part of, you know, some of the, keep the, keep the pleasant surprises, but try to remove some of the negative surprises that can come in the vacation rental category. I think you're seeing Airbnb lean into that with cleaning fees, these sort of surprises that you get after you've decided where you're going to go and then you go to book and there's all these additional fees. Um, that happens with hotels as well. And so, I mean, I think that's, a, that's an industry issue in hospitality that we're working through. Um, but just a little more comfort and predictability in the category, I think is going to go a long way um, to alleviating some of these concerns. You run a business yourself. You're an entrepreneur. Um, you're, you're a leader. You have people. You have a team. Like, what have been you know, your biggest learning as a human and business leader over the last, you know, it's, 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 it's two, three years where there's been so much shift and we're continuing seeing this shift, you say, because of the current market conditions. So, so what is like the, the learning that you have thought, wow, I, you know, I wasn't that aware about that, but now I'm really embracing that and actually taking me on as I'm moving into new obstacles on the way. Yeah. I think especially over the last two or three years, um, Breezeway is a fully remote, you know, distributed company at the moment. Um, I think there is just, and I think we're all learning this. Lots of companies are learning this at the exact same time in this remote distributed model. Um, did you have to time shift more of your time? Like management, people management is taking more time when folks are remote. Um, building those connections with people, interconnections between the team. I've always said, I said this back at Flipkey, and I, I, I believe it still today, like in business, it is a rare, you know, there are very few companies that have the most money, the most people, and the most amount of time to accomplish what they are trying to do. Um, and if you are a company that finds yourself in that situation, you are likely so large that it's hard to execute, right? And so you have to find ways with your, your people and your team to out 
outperform and out collaborate the competition. And I think you do that by leaning into what is it truly that your people need um, to be successful, servant leadership. Um, your job, I think, as a leader is to just unblock everyone else to be even more successful. Um, and there's plenty more I need to do to accomplish that, but that's the that's the goal. And I think over the last two years, I've learned and we're learning collectively, that's even more important when a team is distributed and your interactions are totally, you know, via Zoom or or online or or mostly that way. And is the business going to stay that way? That's that that's your intention because that's does that work or are you like in the in 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 thoughts about how do we actually make sure we we have enough human touch points to build culture because that's that like the typical thing I hear when I've guested the show as well how do how do we ensure culture especially if we don't have like frontline engagement in that kind of way yeah i thought there were going to be no hard questions michael that's a t- that's a tough one the um, <laughs> no i think it's interesting i think that's exactly right I, I don't know um i love the team i feel very fortunate and appreciative of the team we've been able to build and i think embracing i know that embracing a remote and distributed team has allowed us to uh, you know, attract and and work with even better folks than we could if we were, if we were limited. So there are trade offs. I think as we grow, and I'm sure other companies are you know, trying to figure this out too. As we grow, some of that may shift, where we turn, you know, we try to turn certain um, geographic areas into you know a little bit of a heavier density, so everyone isn't just scattershot everywhere. Um, but the real emphasis for us will continue to be the best people to work with, the best people for the job that we think are going to be fun to work with, really great collaborators at the company. Um, so I don't see us giving that up just to build those, um, additional connections. I think, um, we will spend more on travel, less on facilities so that we can get people together. Um, and I think that'll be a common trend. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because actually it's those special moments where you actually, you're not just going into an office to, I need to get my job done, don't talk to me. But actually when you have set the scene, actually fun enough, one of my friends has from 10 years ago when they launched, they were fully remotely from day one. And they've always spent on the experience on the get together. Like the get together is the culture building thing. And that that's not where we do emails or anything. We're like focusing on either the, the project or the, the, the theme or the experience. And we there together. And actually, therefore, we have so energized when we go back. Now we're ready to go and execute on things. Yeah, we did. We pre-pandemic, we would do... Um, we would do an offsite at vacation rentals, bring the whole team together. Um, and now in January, we're doing it again and we're excited to bring it. We're very excited to bring it back. There's folks, you know, there's so many folks on the team who haven't met each other. It's going to be incredible. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you talk about servant leadership, where you get your inspiration from, where's your like source for, for servant leadership? Because that's something I really you know, interested in myself and, you know, but Ken Blanchard has been one of my big inspiration, you know, one book, one minute manager and, and so on. Yeah. I think, um, I think I've picked it up in a number of different books and it's a theme and there's some, there's some entrepreneurs here in Boston who sort of follow that. And I think as I reflected on the type of folks that I think have been very successful to work with both, um, you know, at, you know, on my board of directors or folks that have been at Breezeway that are great managers and, or at Flipkey, that was a common theme that they had. Um, and I felt like that's just like, that's the idea, right? It, that's the idea as you scale a business, that's what you're looking for. Otherwise the scale doesn't work, right? If you're not, you're not really scaling um, with your people, if everyone isn't trying to make everyone else more successful at what they do. It gets it gets harder the larger you get. And I think it gets very, it can be challenging cross department. Um, but that just means it's something you have to focus on. Hmm. Hmm. Super interesting. Um, what 
what what about you as you know you're the founder you're the ceo you have a huge responsibility how do you actually make sure you show up as the best version every day how do you show up pro as i call it do you have like any like hacks or routines anything you do to to make things work for you um it's a great question i um i'm not as many routines. I think it's just something that I try to purposefully do. Try to get a lot of, ex- you know, try to get as much exercise as I can. Try to exercise every day if I can um, and squeeze that in because I think it just provides a little bit more perspective. Walking, also just getting a little bit of fresh air to just, I think it's about trying to quickly get some perspective so that you can have the opportunity to not be so close to your own work so that you can listen, right? And um, I'm sure people on my team that are, you know, that are listening to this are, are you know, smiling about uh, my ability to listen versus talk when I'm in a meeting. But um, whether it's active, you know, whether it's active listening or it's just being open to those ideas, I think you have to be open to other folks' perspectives and try and distill it. That's part of being a leader um, and and this sort of servant leadership piece of it. I don't have any hard routines. I'm not like a big self-help. Probably should be. I'm not a big self-help guy. Uh, I'm just an incredibly motivated guy who uh, I don't find it hard to, um, I don't find it hard to work on this, you know, throughout the day, evening, stolen moments, weekends. It's, um, I find pleasure in the growth of the business, the growth opportunities of the team, um, the value creation for clients, um, is unbelievably fueling, you know, the positive sentiment from clients is unbelievably fueling, not just for me, but for the whole team to say, okay, great. Like this is how you, you dig in and you find that way to continue to keep going. Super interesting. You're actually almost using the journey and the the challenges a business have to actually to move yourself forward. A bit like, you know, there's no stoicism. They talk about the Stoics using the obstacle for the way to become the person you wanna become. Yeah, I'm a big be- I'm a big believer in that. I, I don't know. I'm I, I enjoy a challenge. The challenge of that's the reward for me. The hard work and the challenge of completing it is is the reward. The value delivery, you know, is is really incredible. That's that's what I love to do. Is there a question, Jeremy, you would have loved I asked you, and what would that question be, and what would you have answered? Um, yeah, it's a good one. Um, and maybe you know why travel? You know why travel? Like why 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 this? I've, I've gotten that question a few times. You know. Folks have said, you know, this is a hard thing to flip key was interesting. It's a marketplace. The reason that there weren't really good operational tools is a pretty challenging thing to build. Um, you know, why why this? And um, so maybe that question. And I would have said, I would have said because I think property management is still at the early stages of a massive shift. I think long-term residential managers, even the big ones, Graystar, Avalon, will start referring to themselves, if they don't already, as hospitality companies. I think student housing providers, off-campus housing, student housing, they are hospitality providers. Colleges and campuses, they are hospitality providers. Assisted living, they are actually hospitality providers. They may not have categorized themselves that way yet, but there is no question that service is going to continue to be at the heart of property management and even more so at the forefront. And that you're going to have to deliver because consumer expectations will just continue to rise. They are not going backwards. And I think vacation rentals, short-term rentals, this little category, when you think about the grand scheme of hospitality and property management, it's a niche little piece. They're actually where the ball is moving. Um, they're actually an indicator of the kind of business that I think all property management is gravitating towards. And you know that's why we do this, because we think it's going to be um, a really phenomenal future 
um, at the cross section of hospitality and property management and and prop tech. It's I can't think of anything more exciting um, to be working on, unless I was you know unless I was into like space and um, electric cars. That's pretty cool, but I'm not qualified to do that. No, oh, maybe maybe that's the next thing, Jeremy. <laughs> thank thank you so much for for, for coming on the show. Um, where can, where can people find and uh, connect with you if they they want to check out what Breezeway is doing, or they maybe want to connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they can go to breezeway.io. There's a lot of information there. Um, they can they can email me directly, Jeremiah at breezeway.io. Happy to chat with people, or um, at VIP at breezeway.io um and that goes to all the um that goes to all the right folks internally um love to connect with people talk to them about their operations hear how things hear how they're approaching it um and we really take a point of view um we've built our product and our company listening to operators in the field and what their challenges are so reach out we, we love chatting with you great great Thank you so much uh, for your time. I'm sending you and the team power and energy for 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 the times ahead. I love it. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you having me on the show. I really appreciate that you're listening in. So if you enjoyed today's conversation, please share with others, rate or give a review or subscribe to one of our channels, which all can be done via the website hospitalitymavericks.com. I believe that reading the right books is the key to become a better leader. So I've helped you with a curated list of some of the best books to improve yourself, others, and the organization. Find them on hospitalitymavericks.com. A big thank you to Biz Simply for supporting us, bringing great insights, strategies, and tools to help leaders to become better every day. Check them out at bizsimply.com or on their socials at bitsimply or bitsimply hq you can also email them directly at podcast at bitsimply.com thank you to fina charlson who is the show producer from the podcast collective if you have any ideas and feedback for the show or other thoughts reach out to me via linkedin or via my email michael at hospitalitymavericks.com i'm michael tinkser and you've been listening to the hospitality maverick podcast show Be Maverick.